Policymakers are currently working towards addressing the failings of the economic and monetary union in the euro area. But what were some of the early warning signs that perhaps should have been addressed much earlier? Uh, true. Uh, there, there was extensive research on, on the economic and monetary union in the early 90s at the time of the Maastricht negotiations. Uh, and there were some clear warnings uh, you know, given by this research. Uh, Clearly, it was, it was perceived that countries uh, were in a uh, asymmetric situation, that there was a risk of those asymmetries developing, that the common monetary policy with a single interest rate, was sort of one-size-fits-all monetary policy, could be destabilizing. There were warnings about the fiscal situation. All those things were more or less known. Um, uh, the risk were known. I mean, the fact that they could develop to this, the extent we've seen was, was not known, but, but the warning were there. So economists had done their, their job in a way. Policymakers too often chose this sort of complacent reading of the literature. You could see, uh, you know, there was this idea, perhaps uh, it's not a, what was called an optimum currency area, but it can develop into one. Just by the fact that you're creating a monetary union, countries will become more symmetric, more similar. So the problems that were perceived as potential risk will actually not develop. That was a complacent reading. And too often this kind of complacent reading was chosen because it made things easier, because it avoided you know, uh, hard choices. It avoided, after having uh, made all the efforts to qualify for uh, monetary union, to continue with reform efforts to make the, the, the country, the economies fit uh, for, for the euro and for lasting participation in the euro. What was then completely unforeseen? Well, there were things uh, that were not perceived as being a, a threat or a risk. Almost, almost nobody uh, saw the possibility of uh, financial disruptions, and the kind of capital, massive capital inflows followed by massive capital outflows, uh, um, you know, from North to South Europe. Uh, that we have seen. I mean, true balance of payment crisis in a way. Interestingly, there was in the treaty, there was a possibility of providing balance of payment assistance to countries in trouble. And then at the time of the uh, um, signing of Maastricht, this possibility was removed once you enter monetary union. And the question is why? Because it was seen as, you know, there cannot be a balance of payment assistance because there's no balance of payment anymore. Countries are becoming like regions. So they will be, by definition, everything will be financed. And what we've seen is that, in fact, it has not happened this way. Establishing EMU is a huge undertaking, and we're starting with banking union, but what are some of the tools still to be explored? So since the decision in June on, on banking uh, union, or at least the, you know, the direction taken, and the, the ECB uh, decision with the, the OMT, uh, so the scheme to, to intervene on bond markets, uh, this dimension of financial fragmentation, balance of payment crisis, have, has moved to the center of the policy discussion. Whereas before, um, until, until summer, uh, the, whole, the, the whole focus was on, on the fiscal side, which was a real concern for some countries, but certainly not sufficient to explain what, uh, what has happened. So there, there has been a recognition of the deeper character of this crisis. That leads to, to, to accept that monetary uh, union as conceived in the Maastricht Treaty was incomplete, that it was a neglect of the financial dimension and a neglect of the financial risk it, it could involve. So I think banking union is a big uh, project. We are just at the beginning. It's highly technical, obviously, but it involves many things. Uh, if you go beyond supervision, the resolution of banking crisis, how uh, you're going to uh, potentially uh, mobilize fiscal resources, and then the questions of what are the institutional implications of all that. I think there is an important discussion we're not having yet, the question of labor mobility. And that's an old discussion in a way, because if you look at the way in the US, adjustment between regions, uh, between states uh, takes place, it's largely through labor mobility. In Europe, we're used to thinking that there is very little mobility. In fact, there, there was more. Uh, if you look at Ireland, if you look at Latvia, if you look at Spain before the crisis with all the inflows of people, there was more mobility already. In this crisis, with extremely high unemployment rate in some parts of the euro area, yeah, and some parts that are at full employment or close to full employment, 
we may see much more people moving than we are, we, what we are used to. And this may trigger a whole discussion about you know, what kind of economy is it. We, instead of bringing uh, jobs to people, as we usually think uh, uh, things should happen, maybe people will, will move to jobs. And that has profound implications, potentially.